Hey everybody, Sean here, back with another episode of Underground Comic Review, and today I'll be reviewing Bayou Funnies number 7. Bayou Funnies was started just six months after Zap Comics number 1 came out in 1968. Although, if you do your research, Bayou Funnies has a longer history, as it is the reincarnation of the Chicago Mirror, which was started in 1967. Jay Lynch was the main editor and had a list of amazing artists featured, including legends like Robert Crumb, Skip Williamson, and Art Spiegelman. Unfortunately, it only lasted until 1973 with only eight issues under its belt. This particular issue came out in 1972 and is his second pressing, with the first having 20,000 issues printed and this printing having a very low print run of only 10,000. One easy way to tell which version you have is this printing mistake on the left here. The front cover features nudity, as do a lot of the comics inside, so unfortunately I won't be able to show you everything, but I'll do my best. The cover art is by Art Spiegelman and features three characters. Art Spiegelman's The Viper, Skip Williamson's Snappy Sammy Smoot, and Jay Lynch's Nard and Pat, reacting to the same image of a ravaged woman with her breast exposed. I particularly like the Thrills one and find it funny in its abruptness. The same character featured in that panel is also the main background image for the cover. It should also be mentioned that this comic is a weird size as it's smaller than most. The inside cover is by Robert Crumb and has two characters with quite different art styles, with the male one pinching the female's nipples while saying, Hostess Twinkies! I like the art style. The female is done in a bit more of Crumb's usual style, whilst the other one has clean lines and no shading. I like the panel quite a bit. There's not much to it, but it gives me a chuckle when I see it. The first story features Skip Williamson's commonly used character, Snappy Sammy Smoot. In this story, our main character Sammy goes and sees Jesus Christ Superstar. While he's there, he's quite impressed that these kids these days will give you a religious experience in the first balcony for only $16.50. Outside, after the play, Sammy runs into some, as he puts it, Jesus freaks, that ask him for some spare change. Sammy happily obliges and gives him a dollar because, in his words, hardly compensation for moral idealism the likes of yours. After which, once Sammy is down the street, they mention how this is even better than the ecology racket, as they plan to use the money to score some boons from Strawberry Hill. Once Sammy is home from the play, he catches a TV show starring religious zealot Pat Boone. After that, Sammy goes to bed and has a quite spiritual dream where God tells him to forsake material possessions, abandon the pleasures of the flesh, and spread my truths throughout the world. Next morning, Sammy wakes up, has a shave, and decides he is prepared to face the fires of the furnace, to be an outcast and a martyr, and to pass out religious tracts on a downtown street. So with Sammy's new resolve, he goes about trying to convince people of God's prowess. He talks to junkies who rob him, matronly looking ladies who try to take him up to their place to boogie, and a bank robber who commences to beat him senseless. Now at the end of his day, Sammy looks back at all of the injustices he has faced at the hands of his brothers. He then thinks, what is a messiah without disciples? And who of his friends will be worthy of such serious spiritual discipline? So he goes to his longtime buddy Ragtime Billy. But instead of Sammy convincing Ragtime Billy, Ragtime calls bullshit on everything and informs him that he's been duped again. Sammy then is quite embarrassed and notices that Ragtime Billy's voice sounds just like God's. I like this comic, it has a fun stylized art, and despite the small panels, the picture never feels claustrophobic. I think there's a couple ways to read the message that comes off with this piece, but I find all the messages quite valid, and even still valid today, 44 years later. The next story is by Art Spiegelman, and it's titled, The Viper, Vicar of Vice, Villainy, and Wickedness, and Villy Vetbeck Visits the City, a modern morality play. The story is insanely graphic, pulpy, violent, and perverted. And if you don't like that stuff, you're going to hate this comic. But if you love that kind of stuff, like I very much do, then you will love every jaw-dropping moment. It starts with the Viper, alone in the city at night, and he's bored. So he decides to shoot a cat at point-blank range into almost oblivion. Afterwards, there's a cute little cat burger set. And at 10 cents, what a deal. As we turn the page, we see Billy Vetback coming to the city on a bus from far away, oblivious to the danger that he soon faces. After exiting the bus, he doesn't know where to go, but he sees a stranger down the street and decides to walk up and ask for directions. Though unfortunately for him, that person is the Viper. Billy tells the Viper that he has come to the city to meet up with his sweetheart. The Viper says that's great news and that they have to celebrate. Billy declines the offer, but the Viper has no concern for that and proceeds on forcing Billy into a drunken stupor. Billy then mentions to the Viper that he is not feeling well. The Viper tells him that he has a cure at his place and that they should go there. Once at the Viper's home, the Viper proceeds to whip out his penis and make poor Billy Vetback suck it as he says it's medicine. The Viper tells him faster, but then he goes too fast and the Viper, not being too happy with that, decides to decapitate Billy and show him how to do it properly. Now, for obvious reasons, I can't show you the entirety of the next four panels, but I can tell you it involves a viper having sex with a decapitated head's neck. Once the night is over, the viper decides to clean up the mess he made, but he has one last stroke of genius, and decides to send Billy's suitcase to his sweetheart, with Billy's bloody head inside. As I mentioned before, this is a love it or hate it comic, and I love it, though I can definitely see how one would dislike it. Up next is a one-pager entitled Film Fun by Skip Williamson, where there is a couple having a nice dance at a formal party, then the character comes out of nowhere, stabs a lady through the head, and out the eye with a giant syringe while shooting her dance partner in the head. He then rips off another dancer's arm and proceeds on taking a big bite out of it. He then dances in the dark. 
There's not too much to say about this piece, but I definitely like the art. The next comic is an art and past story by Jay-Z Lynch, as he writes his name this time. So there you have it, folks. Jay-Z is a plagiarist. Anywho, in the story, Nard is feeling overheated because his air conditioner is broken. So he asks Pat to give him a hand and fix it. Pat thinks he can do it no problem, but once he gets started, he finds it's a little more challenging than he expected. So when they turn on the AC unit, it sucks instead of blows and sucks Nard into it, clear across the lawn, right through his neighbor's window and gets his head entirely caught in his neighbor's vagina. Like Monica and a turkey on front. Pat, wondering where Nard went, goes next door and finds Nard and can't believe the ingratitude of Nard having fun while he's hard at work. Then the angry husband walks in, and as you can imagine, he's not too happy. But here comes Pat to the rescue and convinces him that his wife is just giving birth. Once born, I guess you could say, the husband is furious that the baby looks like the neighbor Nard and plans to kill him as soon as he sees him. Which leaves Nard in a sort of Bugs Bunny type scenario where he's stuck pretending to be a baby. It is a pretty funny story and I find it has a Sunday paper cartoon feel despite the graphic nudity. Skip Williamson brings us our next story, entitled The Whiz Kids, where two siblings are being tired of called names and not being accepted. He is either called an AKA from his coach and teammates, or she is either called a bookworm or suggesting that she'll feign at the slightest bit of nudity. So they have a plan, and that's to gain respect from the peers, and it goes as such. They plan to give up their intellectualism, so they immediately start shooting up and having sex with literal pigs. And worst of all, watching primetime network TV. In the end, though, the plans don't work as now their peers find them disgusting degenerates and commence to beat and shun them. So it goes to show you some people you just can't please. The story is kind of short, but that's good, because I find it gets the plot out without dragging for extra pages. I like the art too, it reminds me of notebook drawings with the deep black ink. Next up is another Jay Lynch called Child Martyr, and apparently is a true story told to him by his first grade teacher, Sister Mary Arthur. It's about a young boy who was confronted by some older students from a different school. They start to argue if there is a god or not. The young boy defending his religion ends up being stabbed by the others after not giving in to saying that there isn't a god. In fact, he writes it in his own blood as he dies. And that's the end of the story. Definitely says a lot about religion, but I'll leave you to figure out your own interpretation. The art's pretty good, but I actually find the story a bit of a snoozer after multiple readings. The next story is by Art Spiegelman and it's titled The Squinks, featuring Bert and Harry. Honestly, the comic kind of sucks and it's a bit pointless. It's a rap betting another rat if he can say tongue twister three times. Which is, I'm a shit sleeter, I shit sleet, I'm the best shit sleeter that ever shit sleet. Which he is unable to do, and much his chagrin, he is forced to wear a beanie. Then, of course, there is a moral at the end of the story. Which is, people that think they know everything often end up wearing a beanie. I don't have complaints about the art, but as I said before, the whole comic comes off as pointless and unentertaining. Now we have another Nard and Pat from Jay Lynch. This time Nard is complaining that his old crew is, well, getting older and that nobody gets together anymore. All the while, Nard asks him if he would like a sandwich, which he almost ignores until the final moment. This is another boring story that doesn't entertain me in the slightest. Once again, the art is alright, it definitely looks like Nard and Pat, but that's the only good thing I can say. The next two comics also aren't that great, so I won't bore you with the details. First is called The Thrilling Adventures of Bozo Ribibo by Skip Williamson, where a character's in court saying his alibi. After that comes Ma Cow, She's Always Seeing Things, by Everett Gerdotz, where Ma Cow meets Electricity Ed, who makes all electronics run. Sorry isn't much, but I like the art, and I find Ma Cow's oversized udders to be kind of funny. On the reverse side of this comic is a cool advert for t-shirts you could have gotten if you purchased this issue when it came out. I wish you could still get them, because I wouldn't mind owning a couple. The next story is about a vandal, or in his words, a Dada artist, entitled Randy Nudie in Gorilla Graffiti. In the story, Randy gets caught and thrown in jail so he can't exercise his artistic talent. But as soon as the guard leaves him, he begins defacing the wall of his cell. It's an alright story, but I'm glad it only lasts one page. I like the semi-realism of the art, too. I've always been a fan of that art style. And here comes some more semi-realism with Daniel Klein's Hungry Chuck Biscuits. This is actually the origin story of Hungry Chuck Biscuits, where his parents, looking for a son, decided to go dig one out of the graveyard. Hungry Chuck Biscuits is thrilled to have parents, but he soon learns that it's not all that's cracked up to be. His parents treat him like a slave and make him work till 4 a.m. After a while, hungry Chuck Biscuits has an idea and ties his parents to a wall in the basement and whips them with a garden hose until blood oozes down their back. The story is a classic revenge tale and definitely delivers, but I wouldn't say it goes above and beyond. I really like the design of hungry Chuck Biscuits with his checkered pants and western shirt. And for our last story, we have Back in Bayou by popular demand, Justin Green's Theater of Cruelty presents Life Above the O Geeks, a true story. It's about Justin Green dealing with awful neighbors who persistently annoy him to draw their picture. He eventually he begrudgingly gives in, and when he gets there, he decides that he's going to take it seriously, and becomes rather proud of his work. When all of a sudden, the wife comes in, rips the drawing board out of his hand, and starts erasing his work, saying that her Alvin doesn't look like that, and starts drawing over his drawing because once she got an A in art. He, as you can imagine, is quite upset and demands his work back, and storms out after being called a pinko. He figured that's finally the end of it, but two weeks later, to add insult to injury, she yells at him across the yard, The picture wasn't that good! This to him is the last straw. So he does what any sane person would do, and that's skin their dog alive. If you're an artist, I think you'll find the story quite relatable. Well, everything except for the skinning the dog part. Also, the art is pretty good, but it comes off as a little rushed. And now for the back cover. It's another one of Jay Lynch's Nard and Pat stories. Yes, the third so far. 
This time, it's Nard talking about missing his first wife. This, in turn, makes Pat miss Nard's first wife, so he goes across town and bangs her. It's a pretty straightforward story and gets to the punchline very quickly. I'd say it's right in the middle of the other two Nard and Pat stories quality-wise, with the air conditioner one coming out on top. Well, that covers it for Bayou Funnies number 7. Overall, i say it's an above-average comic, but that's just on the insanity of the Viper story and the interesting religious commentary that's in the Child Martyr story and the Sammy Smut story. There's also a few good one-pagers, like the Robert Crumb one on the inside cover, but there's also a few snoozers about halfway through that definitely bring down the overall quality. In the end, I'd say pick it up if it's cheap, but if it's too expensive, don't worry about it. That is, unless you want to see some interesting fellatio done by a decapitated head, which I do recommend. Well, that does it for another episode of Underground Comic Review. Hope you guys like what you saw. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And there's another video right here if you guys want to check it out. It's something similar. Probably another episode of Underground Comic Review. Once again, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good one.